Hello everybody, it's Mrs. Ware of Stream English here and today I'm going to be talking to you about the top five quotes for you to analyse in the poem Bayonet Charge by Ted Hughes. Now this video is going to assume you already know the basic information of this poem, what it is about, what the key themes are, what the context is behind it. If you don't know those things then you want to have a look at my video, the top five things you need to know about Bayonet Charge and it will give you that foundation information. What this poem is going to do is get kind of deep in the mud of analysing some of the quotes from Bayonet Charge that would be great for you to use in an essay. So let's do this! The first line of this poem that I want us to have a look at is the very first line of the poem. Suddenly he awoke and was running raw. So first of all, there's the fact that this begins in medias res. That means it starts like in the middle of a story, okay? It's like we're kind of jumping in in the middle of action. And that helps to reflect the nature of war in the sense of like, you know, you, you're kind of jumping in in the middle of things and there could be a lot going on. It doesn't have that nice, neat, tidy beginning, middle end to it. It just is there. You've also got the juxtaposition between the verbs awoke and running. Now, like, awoke is like, you know, you've just started your day, it's kind of a bit more kind of relaxed, so just the act of waking up, and then that is immediately be followed by the word running, a dynamic verb of much more kind of intense activity. So the proximity between those two is really telling us again about the confusion and intensity of war itself, and the fact that things can happen suddenly things happen very very quickly um, and you have to be able to adjust and move very quickly with that as well. So from that very opening line we definitely get a sense of the kind of confusion and pace and intensity of conflict. Some people have also wondered whether the way that it's phrased suddenly he awoke and was running is referencing the fact that this poem could be in its entirety a flashback. Like this is a, a soldier having a flashback to an event of war. And that interpretation does have some interesting angles if we think about the context of um, bayonet charge. So Ted Hughes, the writer of this poem, didn't go to war himself, but his father did. So there's a question of like, is Ted Hughes writing this as if he was his father and his father having a flashback to the kind of more difficult moments um, of war? You've also got that really interesting ending word there of raw, like he was running raw. How can somebody run raw? It's got connotations there of being kind of very like uh, instinctive and that's something we're going to see frequently throughout this poem. This sense of like war is not some super sophisticated thing full of military tactics and you know intelligent insightful thought. It's staying the hell alive and, and following your human instincts to keep yourself alive. So that use of that word raw is our first indication of that idea of um, how war is just about kind of responding in the moment. You don't really have any time or ability to have deep thought, you're just kind of very much following your instinct in trying to stay alive. So this very opening line is really important in immediately pulling the reader into war and creating that sense of the confusion and intensity of war that then is carried on in the rest of the stanza. The next line I want to look at is also from that first stanza. The patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye, sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. Now this is a really interesting uh, metaphor here that could be interpreted in multiple different ways, which is great because multiple interpretations are a great way of pushing yourself to the grade nine. And my house is on fire. One second. So let's have a look at this quote then. The first thing we want to look at is that patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye. Patriotism, obviously symbolising the pride and love that he feels for his country. The fact that it is a tear perhaps symbolises the intensity of how he felt that emotion. And in that sense, what we've essentially got here is exploring the reason why he had gone to war. So the fact that it had brimmed, that past perfect tense, is referring to, therefore, the fact that this all occurred before the war happened, therefore making us think it's the reasoning of why they went to war. It therefore makes sense that this line links with that theme of the power of patriotism because we can see how that intense emotion, that tear that he had, is what 
kind of drove him to put himself in this incredibly dangerous situation in the present because of course the rest of the poem is in present tense. What we then have, however, the fact that it had brimmed, it might just not just be a case of telling us he felt this way before he came to war, it might also be a case of starting to hint at how things have changed in the present. In the past he had the patriotic tear, now not so much. And that's what we get from this next line, because we're told that, that patriotic tear is now sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. If we've got the sweating, Okay, if we think on a, a basic science level, what is sweating? You're losing moisture from your skin, essentially. So does that therefore mean that this is a metaphor for him losing that patriotism, that strong emotion he once had because of the intense physical exertion as suggested by the dynamic verb of sweating? Is it suggesting that he's lost that patriotism that he had before because of all the sweatiness that he's feeling um or is it just suggesting that that emotion he had has now translated into physical action so you can see those two different interpretations is this a kind of suggestion of him losing his patriotism as you lose sweat or is it the transition from emotion to action as the tear turns to like the like actual physical exertion of going to war. You've also got that simile, like molten iron from the center of his chest. Why describe the sweat as being like molten iron? Now on a kind of basic level, we can think of this as the um, a representative of the physical pain he's going through fruit via this like running around and the physical exertion of war. Because if we think of molten iron as being like hot and burning, he's hot. He's burning while running around doing stuff for war. Kind of simple there. But if we wanted to think about this simile in a bit more of a complex way, then we could also think about how it's connected to the patriotic tier. We've had a change from something quite small in, in a tier that are brimmed in an eye to molten iron from the centre of the chest. So there's an increasing of size and scale and, and intensity. Again, is that increase in size, scale and intensity suggesting his patriotism has increased in size, scale and intensity? It's moved from just affecting his eye to affecting, like, you know, obviously it's part of his heart as well and it's more of his entire core and being that this patriotism is affecting and that is what is pushing him into this burning physical um, um, exertion and agony of war. Or... Is it that this patriotic tear that's really like small has been just completely lost in the far bigger, more significant scale of the pain and suffering he's feeling because of war? Like the, the patriotism is just gone when compared to that basic physical exertion um, and instinct that he's feeling while being engaged in actual warfare. There's also an interesting question we could have with the molten iron of whether it's foreshadowing something. And what I mean by that is there's the question of what happens to molten iron when it's no longer molten, you know? White iron, basically, I guess is the question I'm asking. Because when molten iron stops and cools, it turns incredibly hard. It turns into solid iron. And so then suddenly our emotional metaphor, because it's molten iron from the center of his chest and that's where his heart is and we get that emotional connection, suddenly there's a question of whether this simile is also suggesting at what's going to happen later. And again, remember how that makes sense with the context, because Ted Hughes knew his father after the war. So Ted Hughes would know the kind of consequences the war had on his father. So is it trying to suggest that those potential consequences of the, the hardening of emotions, the closing off your heart, um, the kind of building up a barrier or a wall between your emotions that's really kind of tough to get through? Is it trying to almost foreshadow at, at those potential consequences of war as well? So this is a really important line because of the two different ways of interpreting it. If we think about the journey our speaker's gonna go through in this poem, on the one hand, we could say that 
this is a quote examining how in all of the confusion and intense action of war and the, the pain and difficulty of the physical exertion of war, it is patriotism that's going to keep our speaker pushing on through. That's going to change in the stanza later, as we'll look at in a second. Or is this line the beginning of suggesting that because of the chaos and the intensity and the physical exertion of war, it's our first line really stressing like he might have been patriotic once, but that's now like gone because of how tough war is. The next quote we're going to look at arguably comes after a Volta. Now, the reason I say arguably is because we could analyse, as we've just seen, that patriotic tear quote as suggesting that, like, the speaker is losing his patriotism. However, if we've analysed it in the sense of actually he's kind of engaging in a patriotic act by, for his country, then this next part actually is more of a Volta, because what essentially happens in the second stanza is he suddenly stops and has that why am I doing this moment that's essentially what this stanza is about and so there's ultimately a question of in the first stanza does he know why he's doing it if the answer is yes this is a change if you want to argue in the first stanza he's still there's a sense of him not really knowing why he's doing it then it's just a continuation so again multiple interpretations you can argue both angles Without a doubt, though, in this stanza, he is definitely feeling like he's questioning what is his purpose, what is his point there. And we see that in this great metaphor, in what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations was he, the hand, pointing that second. Now, there's a lot to unpack here. But essentially, we have to think about what's being compared. So the clockwork of the stars and the nations. So he is comparing the kind of act of war to clockwork of stars and nations. Was he the hand pointing that second? He's continuing the clock metaphor, referring to himself as the hand on a clock that ticks along the seconds. If we think about what that's suggesting then, so ignoring cold for a second, I'll come back to that clockwork of the stars and the nations now stars are often used to symbolize fate and destiny so there's the sense there of like you know life has a set way that it's going to go like clockwork right there's a pattern it's going to follow and therefore it's suggesting how he doesn't have any choice or freedom for himself also that reference to the nations of course if we think about world war one plural nations involved in that war and therefore it's a reference to the kind of clockwork of politics and governments of war so in both sense there's a idea of him being controlled um not controlled on an individual level of their like his puppet masters pulling the strings but just that there are higher powers that have the control that make the decisions that then ultimately mean he doesn't really have any choice there's like an organization to it there's a clockwork to it the fact that it's called cold, of course, suggesting a lack of emotion. So is this a kind of anti-war message of suggesting that, um, you know, they don't care about the people at war, that the nations don't care about the people at war, they don't care about the suffering they're going through in the name of war, they just care about the kind of the politics, the, the organisation of the warfare, that kind of thing. They prioritise the more mechanical, logical side of war, not caring about the emotional side of war. The fact that we've got also the clockwork of the stars, the cold clockwork of the stars, it's that idea of how with fate and destiny, it's not an emotional response, it's just a kind of way that the world works. This is how things operate in the world as it is and when i say the world i don't mean in the sense of the human version of the world i mean as in just the you know however we think the world functions spiritually the deeper level of the world including the animal kingdom that kind of thing that kind of like you know the circle of life kind of clockwork is what i'm getting at you know just the way the universe works and so what we've got there on on two different levels is a sense of him being insignificant in contrast to the much bigger picture of the war and of the world generally and we get that from the way the metaphor continues was he the hand pointing that second now if he's the hand of the clock he's certainly part of it 
but if you think the clockwork is what makes the hands of the clock go round and the hands of the clock are what are kind of doing the work of like telling you the actual time so in that sense it's almost a metaphor for the different roles that they hold in the war while the nations are all about that kind of stuff in the background the organization the logistics he's the one who's actually out front and center doing things but still being controlled by the things in the back but also he's the hand for the seconds now i don't know about you but unless somebody says to me okay you've got one minute I don't really pay attention to the hand that's counting the seconds. That's not an important hand on the clock. So we could perhaps argue the fact that he refers to himself as the part of the clock that's counting the seconds is suggesting his insignificance. Um, we could also suggest that by choosing such a small uh, unit of time, it's suggesting, a, again, how quickly things can change in war. So if he's pointing that second, it's like, you know, um, his fate can change very, very quickly, basically. Because of the cold clockwork of the stars and the nations, what's going to happen to him can change very, very, very quickly. So there's two different sides to it in that sense. There's a comment on his power in uh, war and how much control he has over his own decisions. And then there's also a comment on the intensity of war again in sense of how quickly things can, can change, basically. There's also the fact that this is a question, just the fact that it's an interrogative um, and how that highlights his uh, sort of internal conflict beginning that questioning that he's going to start going through and that will be continue to be reinforced in this stanza so i think that the reason this is such a great metaphor is that it has two parts to it the fact that it's looking at you know the possible insignificance of this soldier but also the fact of the kind of um, speed and frequency of war. I think it's also great because it's a really key line in this section where he's starting to question what the point is. And that's a really key emotion that the speaker of this poem goes through. And I think this is a great quote for exploring that emotion as well. The fourth line I want to have a look at is this one in the last stanza. Um, we need to kind of read it for it just to make sense for a second. We need to read it with the line before as well. So he plunged past with his bayonet toward the green hedge. King, honour, human dignity, etc. Dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm. Now, first of all, the line before it, he plunged past with his bayonet towards the green hedge. So the green hedge, uh, people have analysed this as being like, you know, he's referring to the enemy that he's running at as a green hedge. It's almost like there's so many of them in their um, uh, greeny, camouflage uniforms that they seem like a kind of big block of people. So he's not even viewing them as people anymore. He's just viewing them as an obstacle he needs to get past. Um, but that is also heavily linked to then what we get in this great line, king, honour, human dignity, etc. dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm. Now, this is an important development from our cold clockwork line because there he was kind of questioning what is my place in all of this now he's establishing more of a kind of concrete view of these things are not important here and that's going to be a real change from our patriotic tier line as well if we look at that list that we've got in that first line king honor human dignity what do those three things represent they represent the three potential reasons why you would go to war for king and country for the honor of fighting for your country for the human dignity of like trying to preserve the human dignity of those suffering in in you know the different circumstances that are going on in whatever country you're fighting against etc so those three all symbolize those reasons why you would go to war, the patriotism, if you will, uh, in particular because of the king and the honour, the, the reasoning you would have, except it's completely undermined, these lists of these powerful, important, abstract nouns completely undermined by the colloquial etc. Making it seem as if it's just like almost meaningless it's just this and this and this and this as if like you know they don't really matter that's a big contrast to our patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye before and suggests that now if he hadn't already because obviously you could have analyzed the sweating like molten iron to suggest at that point he was losing his patriotism but if you interpreted that point as he hasn't lost it yet here he definitely doesn't care anymore like he most definitely is just feeling those three things 
just do not matter. And that's reinforced in the simile, dropped like luxuries. So of course a luxury is something that's nice to have, but that you don't need. And so the fact that they are dropped, obviously he's gotten rid of them. Um, it also has like dropping something, it's almost quite a kind of quick instant action too. So I think that altogether it's really conveying just how he has abandoned the sophisticated complex reasoning behind you know going to war and instead it's much more about the reality in a yelling alarm now we can think of the yelling alarm as being like the instinctive emotional response the fear the panic that he's going through at war and in that sense this line has a very similar idea to what we've already said about other lines in the poem you think going into war that you're doing it for these brave noble reasons when you actually get there, it's just about following your human instinct to survive. That's it. It's just about the yelling alarm. So that yelling alarm is about much more than just conveying his fear and panic. It's about conveying that it's about fear and panic and basic human instinct taking over the much more sophisticated um, ideas. And I think we get that from that juxtaposition between the abstract um, of like honor and human dignity. And yes, king is technically a concrete because the king is like an actual person, but I would argue it's still symbolic of a lot of kind of abstract concepts like patriotism and love of your country and stuff like that. So we have those abstract, much more complex images contrasted against the just very, the, the kind of um, basic dynamic um, action of like yelling alarm. Um, I think that's a really important thing to spot there of that, that contrast. It's abandoning the sophisticated in the name of just human instinct and survival. So if we think about the progression of our speaker across this poem, we've gone from the physical um, suffering that he's going through because of the intense activity of war um, to questioning like, why am I here? To feeling like you know what I've just got to get through this I've just got to survive so this is a really really different kind of way of thinking about war if you're watching this video because you're doing the AQA power and conflict cluster this is a really different way of thinking about war than in something like charge of the light brigade it's almost like the polar opposite charge of the light brigade when they were faced with impossible circumstances and difficulty they maintained, in Tennyson's eyes, they maintained the, the bravery, the nobility, the, you know, all of that. Bayonet charge is the opposite. Bayonet charge is like, screw this noise, I just need to get out of this alive, forget about the king or whatever else. So this is a really, really great, great quote for showing that transition from someone who wants to have patriotism to someone starting to question what the purpose is to someone who's really decided the purpose is insignificant compared to the deeper um, focus of maintaining a heartbeat, essentially. The last quote I want to look at today is also the last line of the poem because again, just like with the first line, the last line is often a really important one to look at. And the last line of the poem we've got here is to get out of that blue crackling air, his terror's touchy dynamite. So another reason why I think this is great is because it follows on really, really nicely from the king on a human dignity because it's literally the same sentence. So when thinking about what this line means, we have to think of it in relation to what we've already read. So he's plunging towards the enemy with his bayonet. Screw the kind of sophisticated reasons why you go to war. Just got to like get through the fear, got to survive here. And that is what's reinforced in these last two lines. To get out, so he wants to escape, of that blue crackling air. So that's referring to just like how the air is filled with um, bullets, the kind of noise of, of gunshots, possibly also like explosions and that kind of thing. His terror's touchy dynamite. So he's trying to get, we can always think of this sentence as like backwards. He's trying to get his terror's touchy dynamite out of the blue clap crackling air, out of the battlefield basically. So in that sense, when it comes to analysing this quotation, there's a couple different things we want to look at. First of all, to get out, 
the sense of escape, reinforcing that that is just his goal now, is just to get away from the conflict, to survive the conflict. It's not about the sophisticated reasons like king, honour and human dignity. The fact that it's referred to as blue crackling air. I think on the one hand we could say this is similar to the other images, like the centre of his chest, like the um, uh, running roar, where it just seems quite vague and confused, almost like he's not 100% certain what's going on because he doesn't have time to process the specifics, is very much responding instinctively to things. We could also say the fact that he describes it by the air crackling is that it just feels like the entire world is attacking him, essentially. You know, this isn't him versus man, this is almost like nature versus him. Now, of course, he doesn't mean that literally, he's not trying to suggest nature is against him, but we've had images to do with nature before. The yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle, the bayonet towards the green hedge. So he keeps referring to things going on um, in war via this natural imagery and there's a question of well, why? Why refer to um, the various actions and violence that's going on in war with the threshing circle, with the green hedge, with the blue crackling air? And I think that one interpretation is just that it feels like war has taken over everything. You know, there is no separation between the, the natural world and this war anymore. It's, it's in everything. It's in everything in the environment. Um, and you can't distinguish anymore between, you know, a hedge and a human because it's just they are all one. It is all war. It is all chaos, basically. Everything is like intermingling and you can't tell what's what anymore. So I think it's part of reinforcing that um, confusion of War 2. We can also see that confusion in the uh, change we've had in colours as well because earlier it was a yellow hair, now it's blue air and that kind of confusion of colour as well reinforcing that sense of just everything being really like weird and, and, and strange. I think that we were also getting a sense of um, a lot of sound, you know, a lot of that um, onomatopoeia because you've got yelling alarm that we had in the earlier line of the, the panic and now we've got the blue crackling air. So we're getting more and more um, imagery created of just how overwhelming all the, all the sound is. And I think that's also reinforced by that, that juxtaposition of, of blue and crackling and two very different senses coming together there in terms of like sound and sight but also that don't really fit together. Blue has much more connotations like if I just told you it was a nice blue sky it has much more connotations of being quite calm and soothing but crackling is very kind of intense and and maybe even makes us think of like electricity um, especially if it's blue. Um, so again that juxtaposition between the blue and the crackling creates a sense of confusion and creates a sense of like, is anything nice anymore? Everything is just really, yeah, it's really unexpected and, and confusing is definitely the sense we're getting of what war is like here. We also get in that last line, his terror's touchy dynamite. So this is what he's looking to get out of the battlefield. He's looking to get out his fear, his terror. So the fact that that is the very last line, it ends on his terror, I think that's really important because essentially it never ends on a neat conclusion, okay? The poem does not end with us seeing him get through the battle. It almost ends in an action just as it began. It ends in an action of him running at a green hedge. We never see the conclusion of him running at that hedge. And so in that sense, it's, it's, yeah, it's, again, ending on that note of we will never know how this ends for him, just as it starts in that we don't really properly know where he's come from, where he is, what's really going on. But what we do know, unequivocally, is his fear. And that's what adds quite a sad tone to the poem, is that combination of the confusion and intensity and, and difficulty and struggle of war that we've seen in lines like the sweating like molten iron, that we've seen in things like running roar, that we've seen in loads of other lines in the poem like the dazzled with rifle fire, the bullet smacking the belly out of the air, all of that is also just right next to the confusion, the, the um, feeling of like loss and and fear and panic that we also get. 
in our patriotic tear that's been lost, in our cold clockwork, in the um, listening between his footfalls for the reason of his still running, and now in the terror's touchy dynamite. Now if something's touchy it means it's like very sensitive, so it's almost like he's at the, the limit of his fear now. He's at that kind of royal ex extreme. Um, and that's quite nicely reinforced just by the sound technique of the alliteration in terror touchy. It's really kind of, it's very tight in the way that it sounds. And also, the, um, well first of all, already technically we've had a personification of his terror. His terror has been given its own identity separate from him. That's how overwhelming it is. It's like his terror is its, its own separate um, identity now. But I think then applying that metaphor on top of it of his terror being like dynamite. So is it a case of he now sees himself as a weapon? And that's the only way he views himself or is the metaphor more referring to how close to the edge he is like he feels like he's going to explode at any moment is that perhaps like foreshadowing the the explosion in the sense of he's about to you know run really into battle and have to engage in that violence engage in that act because of his terror his terror is at its limit and when it explodes it's going to result in the consequence is going to be that brutal violence in order to try and survive um, yeah, there's a couple of different ways we can interpret that, but I think the key thing that we need to take away from this poem as a whole is it's super critical of war in the sense of we just get this contrast between expectation of reality of, of you know, what you might think war had been like with that patriotic tear, the king, on a human dignity versus just the endless confusion, suffering, fear, of the reality and how that is all consuming so those last four lines all the way from the king on a human dignity etc to his terrorist touchy dynamite that is the key message that the poem is essentially ending on is that the expectations have been completely forgotten and all it's been replaced with is fear in chaos